Many women and girls in Afghanistan feel the world has abandoned them, particularly after UN met the Taliban leaders in Doha without Afghan women present and, and without women's rights on the agenda. Obviously, you still care, but are they right? Have diplomats, global institutions, and major media outlets abandoned Afghan women and girls? When I hear the uproar of Afghan women that they have been abandoned, I think um, there is a, a strong reason behind that. And that is the fact that it has been three years that Afghan women have been denied their human rights. Girls have been banned from their school for more than a thousand days. And women are excluded from conversations uh, with the Taliban where decisions about the future are made. If any woman is in that situation, I'm sure she will feel betrayed. She will feel the outrage. So when I look at the, the calls of Afghan women in this time where they feel abandoned, they feel uh, that people are leaving them behind, it is absolutely right. And for how long should they wait? They were told in the, in the beginning few months that of course women, women's rights is our priority. And, and before you know it, it has already been three years. It scares me and it worries me to know that uh, this could go on. This could go on and women could be excluded. And I really want to uh, share my solidarity and support with Afghan women, uh, especially the Afghan women activists and the civil society activists who are there on the front lines, they're advocating for Afghan women uh, at all of these global forums in the country, outside the country, and their voices are so critical. That's why uh, in the Doha um, forum, when there were uh, discussions, this is the point that I highlighted to the Secretary General of the United Nations, that women cannot be excluded. And this is the message that I want to carry forward. We cannot exclude Afghan women from the conversations where decisions about their future are made, and we cannot ignore the rights of women and girls in Afghanistan. Afghan women see and appreciate the effort you have put into campaigning gender apartheid um, in Afghanistan to be recognized as a crime against humanity. Why this is a priority for you? And how close do you believe you are to achieving this objective? When I think about a ban on girls' education, it shocks me that it can go on for so long. And we see um, that it gets normalized. Countries are normalizing relationships with the Taliban and people are putting it as an issue on the side. A system like gender apartheid, when it gets codified, gives us an opportunity to call the edicts and the decrees that the Taliban have are issuing against women and girls a crime that we recognize what the Taliban are doing is a systematic oppression and it is a crime against humanity. We cannot allow this to happen. And for me, it's about um, the accountability. And Sahar can tell us more about like its, its importance in giving that hope to Afghan women. Yes, sir, please. Absolutely. I think, I think we're two years ago, very few people were talking about what was happening in Afghanistan as gender apartheid. Two years later, there is a broad global coalition of NGOs, uh, of leaders, of supporters, of allies like Malala, Malala Fund, and member states of the UN who are very open to the idea of adding gender to the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty. Um, so I think we're a lot closer than we were two years ago. Um, and I think it's really important to keep an eye on that momentum and for everybody to keep learning more about gender apartheid and to keep pushing our representatives and our leaders to think about gender apartheid and what is happening to women and girls in Afghanistan when they're engaging with the Taliban, when they're sitting across the table from the Taliban. Yeah, and. Uh, and just to add to that, I had the opportunity to visit South Africa last December. And when I met with the activists in South Africa and the way they were talking about apartheid and how they all came together, it was about the unity of activism in the country and also outside the country that helped them 
to uh, to dismantle and to uh, and to challenge that system of apartheid and they were sharing their solidarity with afghan women and girls i was invited to speak at the nelson mandela lecture and amazing um, human rights experts were there uh, but including an afghan activist uh, meetra mehran who spoke there and and this connection between south africa and afghanistan is very relevant and i remember the uh, the the words of support from the inc these incredible south african um, prominent figures who were saying that we do not want history to be repeated in any form and we do not want to see another group of people mm -hmm. that is women being oppressed systematically in another country if it was wrong in south africa it is wrong in afghanistan as well and i have met politicians and and representatives from other countries as well including um albania and malta and mexico and i am really optimistic that they are sharing their solidarity and they are sharing their openness to a codifying gender apartheid and i think uh, more countries should step forward and 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 share their support so there is that hope a major question for afghan women is what they were recognizing gender apartheid as a crime against humanity will bring change for their daily lives do you do you think it will i think that's a really good question i think what is happening to women and girls in afghanistan is so urgent it's happening to them today it's happening to them right now so we need to do everything that we can push on whatever levers that we can to make sure that they are supported in any way that we can support them for that reason malala fund as part of the afghanistan initiative which i run we support education programs across the country for girls uh past grade 6 we support advocacy efforts and women activists so we're doing everything that we can to meet as much of the urgent need as possible will codifying gender apartheid fix everything in afghanistan overnight absolutely it won't um what it will do is it will give afghan women the tools to be able to hold the taliban accountable uh the amazing penny andrews uh who's a south african scholar and a a, a friend of malala and malala fund always says in order to address the harm and repair the harm first you have to name it which is why we're calling it gender apartheid so the naming it the codifying it is a first step towards repairing that harm i think in the international system we do need a mechanism of accountability for the violations of the rights of women and girls and it is disappointing that we don't really have that yet and i do want to make a distinction that of course you know we can we can talk about gender discrimination and gender persecution and there are other forms of dis, of of violations of human rights but those are not sufficient to actually recognize the intensity of what is happening in afghanistan on a systemic level in the whole country we know that the taliban have issued more than 85 edicts and decrees limiting women and girls from going to salons doctors and going to parks and going to their schools or going to um a doctor going to work all of these basic things that every woman should be able to do freely these are taken away and we know that the taliban are making it really hard for women to have these basic opportunities like any other person should have gender apartheid as a system uh, needs to be codified because we need to create a system of accountability i want to feel safe and i want afghan girls to feel safe and we do not want to live in a world where in uh, you know in 2024 girls can be banned from school and women can be banned from work and we do not want to see that in the future happening ever again this should never happen again we can never witness a ban on girls in access to education and we can never see women being limited from their rights given the taliban currently have a tight hold to power in afghanistan what future do you see for afghan women for the next few years in terms of education i do carry optimism with me and i would say that we are in a lucky time that we have technology and tools through which we can make education accessible to girls while they are at home and i always tell people that we need to think creatively when the taliban are banning girls from school what can we do to take education to their homes 
and make it much easier for girls to keep learning while they wait for their schools to be reopened. We cannot give up on the fight to reopen schools, but we should be using these tools and technology that we have. And through Malala Fund, um, you know, Sahar um, is, she's the director of our Afghanistan initiative, and uh, she um, is, has done incredible work in finding those organizations in the country who are providing education to girls through radios and television and other digital platforms. We need to keep girls learning. And uh, through one of the organizations that we are supporting, we're reaching up to one million young people and uh, we hope that we can do more. And it's thanks to the support that people are providing us, thanks to their donations, that it's helping us do all of this work. Um, and at the same time, we're supporting education activists um, outside the country as well, in the diaspora, to help them in their campaign, to hold the Taliban to account, to ask leaders uh, to do more, and to create a system of accountability, to recognize gender apartheid, and to keep on building pressure to protect the women, uh, women's and girls' rights in, in the country. You endured and fought against restrictions similar to those Afghan women and girls face now. How do you evaluate the effectiveness and the impact of the last three years of Afghans, women, Afghans struggle, both inside and outside the country? And what aspects have been most successful and what strategies do you think could imp improve their impact? I can say a lot about this. Um, in the past three years, the courage and the resilience of Afghan women have given me hope and it has given many Afghan girls and women hope. This is giving the country a bit of hope. When I look at the incredible stories of the Afghan women activists who are putting their lives at risk to advocate and to fight for their rights. I have seen footage of Afghan women protesting against the Taliban in front of them. Some of them have been put in prison. Some of them have been beaten up. And, and we have seen these horrible stories, um, how they face threats, but these women are not giving up because they know that they do not have a future if they accept what the Taliban are saying right now, if they decide to live under it, there is no future for them. And we need to learn from them. We need to learn from their courage and resilience and be brave as them and take their call forward. That's why I have made a commitment to my Afghan sisters that I will continue the fight and I will ask leaders to stand up with Afghan women and girls. And I, I, would, I would like to add to that, that I think one of the ways that we're seeing the impact of the bravery of the women and girls in Afghanistan and in refugee communi communities and those in exile is the fact that we're having this conversation right now, is the fact that the conversation, the debate, the push, the momentum around gender apartheid is happening at all. It is because of those women who are brave enough to go and protest against the Taliban. Is it because of those women who are recording what is happening in their communities? It is because of those girls. Malala Fund is in touch with and supports thousands of girls across Afghanistan who talk to us all the time and tell us what is happening to them, but also show us how they're resisting, how they keep learning. I think none of this work would be possible without those women and those girls. And it's and they're, everything they're doing is, is powerful. And in two years, we've got to a point where over 10 member states are talking about the possibility of codifying gender apartheid. I think that is real power. Rukhshana Media recently reported on a video of the Taliban gun raping a female activist. To verify it, I had watched it myself and it was truly horrific. Why do you think there is not more global outreach about this kind of abuse, which is now well documented. I cannot imagine the horrors that Afghan women have faced in the past three years from the Taliban, from beatings to, as you said, this, this recent video of a, a gang rape. It is, it is horrendous. It is, uh, it's, it's insane that it's happening and we are just allowing it and we are not um, we're not screaming about it. That's why I think we need to push for this campaign against 
the gender apartheid that the Taliban have imposed because we need to remind people that the people who are currently in power in Afghanistan, the Taliban, are the ones who are doing these things, who are committing these um, horrible acts against the women and girls of Afghanistan. And usually, of course, like women face discrimination on so many levels, but you hope that the country where the people who are in power, they would be, they would be protecting you. But when you are in a situation where those who are meant to protect you are exploiting that power and they are abusing you and they are violating all of your human rights, then where do you go? Where do Afghan women go to seek justice? Where, where, where do they go when they're beaten, when they're harmed, when, when they're put in prisons? Where do they go? Because the Taliban are not going to give them justice. Mm -hmm. That's why, again, codifying gender apartheid and creating a system of accountability is critical. When the U.S. sent troops to Afghanistan in 2001, one of the arguments often made for the, for, for the military campaign was that America was fighting for the rights of Afghan women. Why do we not hear from, more from people who made this argument, like First Lady um, Laura Bush, uh, now Afghan women face the same or worse restriction in 2001. In the past 20 years, the, it was really the bravery and the courage of the Afghan women that really changed things. Even with the limited resources, with the limited efforts, they fought really hard for their rights, their access to education, um, opportunities in work, in politics, in other fields of life. And when you hear their stories, even in the past 20 years, how brave and courageous they were, I think they, uh, we need to applaud their, their activism for that. And it is true that uh, you know, when the US intervened or when you know, the NATO intervened, everybody was talking uh, about protecting women and girls. And today, the exact opposite has happened, where women's rights are taken back. The years, or rather decades of progress has been taken back and we see silence. And I can understand the, the sense of betrayal that Afghan women feel. Um, and like Sahar can, can share more because you know you, you have family, you have so many friends there. Um, and, but even when I look at it from the outside, I think uh, this is not fair at all on the Afghan women. And for me, it was never about you know, the presence of the troops and uh, you know, uh, should the troops have left or not. For me, it was more about how they left and, and in what conditions they left Afghanistan mm -hmm. and how these countries then turned away from the country. That they negotiated with the Taliban <laughs> directly, they excluded women, mm -hmm. and again, we see those things happening. So this is where we need to make a distinction that when we are talking about the future of Afghanistan, women have to be at the center, women have to be included, and 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 women's rights. You know, if the world says that it's you know looking at it in a feminist way, and it has some countries say that they have feminist foreign policies and they care about women's and girls' rights and they care about their daughters and they care about girls, then they need to show us what that means, what those values mean to them when it comes to Afghan girls and Afghan women. Um, I think I think the U.S. and uh, all the countries that had presence in Afghanistan for 20 years have a distinct responsibility um, to the refugees who are escaping now because of what's happening in Afghanistan and to the women they abandoned because of the withdrawal agreement that they signed. They do have a distinct responsibility. But part of the work and the movement building we're doing around gender apartheid is to build a global movement of as many states and allies as possible to say what is happening in Afghanistan is not acceptable and to clearly signal to those brave women and girls that they're not alone, that we are watching what's happening and we, will not, we won't abandon them. If you were to send a message to Afghan women and girls through this conversation, what it would be? I feel so lucky that I celebrated um, this Malala Day with Afghan girls in a school in the UK. I met these incredible Afghan girls who shared their stories of resilience and courage and how passionate they are for their education 
and they want to see a future of education and equal opportunities for their Afghan sisters. I want to convey that message to all my Afghan sisters who are watching me from Afghanistan or any part of the world that I stand with you and I will continue to raise your voice at every platform and we will hold leaders to account to ensure that they protect your rights and they make no compromise on your future and that they share their solidarity and support with you. A message to female journalists, especially my colleagues in Afghanistan who are working in hiding. I want to applaud the work of all female journalists and I oftentimes remind people that my own story of activism was only possible because of the journalists. The journalists who reached out to me, who covered my story on their camera, who helped me write my blog, who helped me write those articles. So without your platforms, without the risk that you take, um, a lot of us uh, are not able to convey our message. So your work is so important because you are bringing the stories of Afghan women and girls to the center and you are helping people in other parts of the world connect to it. And I always remind people that at the center of activism is the stories. And it's the stories of these Afghan girls and Afghan women that keep us going. Is there anything I haven't asked about that is important for this discussion? I would like to add one point, and that is in the issue of Afghanistan, we have met so many people who oftentimes bring up this um, excuse that what's happening in the country is because of culture and religion. And I have challenged that always. Um, I'm a Muslim and uh, I'm Pashtun as well. And I do not accept any of that as part of my culture or religion. And that does not represent Afghanistan either. Afghanistan is a very diverse country in terms of culture, in terms of, um, in terms of traditions, in terms of history. And, uh, and we cannot allow a group who is violating human rights to be excused in the name of culture or religion. There is a standard of human rights and no person can use the excuse of religion and culture to get away with it. You cannot ban girls from education. You cannot stop women from work. You cannot be abusing and you cannot be violating the human rights of a person and saying this is a cultural issue and this is a domestic issue. These, are, these cannot be excused. There is a standard of human rights that everybody has to follow. Um, and I want the women who are from those cultures and from, those, from that religion uh, to be the true representatives of that. They're defining what that culture truly means and they're defining what that religion truly means, where they have their equal rights and they have their independence um, while they're still celebrating their culture and their religious identity as well. So the Taliban cannot be using this excuse. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so Thank much. You.